We used to glorify science for making progress possible. All our conveniences come from the application of scientific knowledge. But now we sometimes condemn science for our failure to use that knowledge wisely. Science just makes wars worse. It doesn't help them, it doesn't stop them. It just makes them worse. And I think I'm going to study humanities and religion because that's where the answer really is. And we can't hope to stop wars by science, but only through religion and humanities. Here we are spending billions of dollars sending man up to the moon. But yet here on Earth, people are living in poverty. The housing around here is just ridiculous. It isn't surprising that science is blamed for the world's ills. Scientists have done what once seemed impossible. So we tend to think they can find an answer to every problem. Like controlling insects, which destroy a third of the world's food crop. And spread diseases like malaria, which these mosquito larvae can transmit when they mature. We once believed chemicals, like DDT, were the answer. But we soon discovered that insects quickly develop a resistance to chemicals. Now, DDT hardly affects mosquitoes at all. But insecticides do affect other living things. Computers are helping identify effective insecticides that have fewer side effects. Computers now touch almost everything in our lives. From keeping track of school records, all the way to scheduling airline flights, and landing airplanes completely automatically, without any help from the pilot. Yeah, computers, uh, I think I can appreciate computers uh, as much as anybody else. In fact, uh, that's why I've got this unemployment check on time today. The uh, computer system also put myself and about 50 other people out of work on the assembly line at the company I worked for. Without computers to keep track of the paperwork our society generates, the whole economy would fall. Computer networks can store vital information about millions of people. But what about the risk of computer mistakes? And how can we prevent others from using memory banks to discover more about us than we want them to know? Computer analysis has helped geneticists unlock some of the very secrets of life, indicating in advance whether children will be born healthy or deformed. They do it by culturing cells from unborn human embryos and then counting under a microscope whether all 46 normal chromosomes are present. This way, couples can know their chances of delivering healthy children in advance, sometimes even before conception. Some of the long-term implications have been considered by Dr. Arthur Robinson. We're now in the midst of new discoveries which may give man the power to control his own evolution. That power is undoubtedly many years in the future. However, already we have the ability to control the birth of individuals with serious defects. Eventually, chromosomes may be engineered like building blocks to produce perfect babies. But who is to decide what's perfect? And how will we prevent birth defects and yet not violate the rights and privacy of prospective parents? Freedom of personal choice is also a concern of biofeedback and behavior modification researchers. Newly perfected instruments can chart the rhythms of the brain. When the readings are displayed, subjects can learn to alter those rhythms consciously. When uh, 
people are under pressure, the brain signals the muscles to contract. If the muscles stay contracted for too long a time, like say in the head area, then you may develop a, a tension headache. And these biofeedback instruments that we have here, we can use to, to teach people the uh, art of relaxation. Using related techniques, scientists can already greatly modify human behavior and actually can control the behavior of rats. If human behavior can be manipulated that way, who will decide who must be controlled? And who will do the controlling? Because the world is interconnected, often in ways we don't fully understand. Everything eventually has an impact on everything else, be it computers, insect control, genetics, behavior modification, or the weather, which controls how well crops grow. And it's the weather that affects our travel, and sometimes safety. Extreme weather is directly responsible for an average of 500 deaths and over $2 billion worth of property damage in the United States every year. Because it is so important, man has tried since the earliest times to control the weather. Meteorologists now can modify some kinds of weather and hope to control even more. The question about the weather and about many other areas where scientists are working is this. How much should they control? For example, when a hurricane strikes, it can cause enormous damage. Research has been conducted to steer these storms away from population centers. But if a way to direct hurricanes is perfected, who would decide that it's better to steer away from one city and let it hit somewhere else? In effect, it's a question of who owns and controls the weather. In a part of Colorado known as Hale Alley, farmers have long endured damage from the weather. I'll cite you one case back in 1948. We had seven hailstorms through here. We harvested uh, less than 10% of a normal crop. It came in, it came through here, and it completely wiped out everything. That year, my folks had nothing. It just killed chickens just like if you went out there and shot them with a 22 rifle. Now, when you get something like that, now that's, that's a heavy loss. The National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, has been experimenting with methods to suppress the hail that devastates this region. The most promising technique is to seed potential hailstorm clouds from airplanes. Silver iodide particles from the burning flares are carried up into the clouds where they react with supercooled water. We think that the particles will produce small hailstones like these that do no damage instead of big ones like this that can wipe out a wheat field in a few minutes. Because we're concerned about the effects that weather modification may have throughout an area, we've been very careful to consult with the people who live up here in northeastern Colorado, where we're conducting an experiment to see if we can suppress damaging hail. The farmers and ranchers most affected by the experiment are not in total agreement. 
I would be willing to pay, I believe, uh, maybe a 10% uh, gross crop production premium for uh, hail suppression. Until uh, it was proven that they could suppress hail, that I, I think it ought to be uh, a research financed by the government. Well, I'm not in favor of it because in the first place, I'm not sure that nature should be tampered with to that extent. In the second place, I'm not sure that it's, at least for areas like this, it's not economically a good thing if it works. But I would assume that they'd have to prove to us that they could suppress hail, uh, say, uh, from 75 to 90 percent uh, every year. Then I think we could rely on it. Uh, this thing would have to be controlled, uh, you know, so it, it would benefit the general country if, say, we'd get two or three inches less rain in a year, even though we didn't get any hail with it, that could mean a fellow in my position would be running maybe a hundred head less cows, which could, for all practical purposes, put you out of business. Uh, I introduced the bill in the Colorado legislature because of problems we had had in the local area of Colorado where I live. Uh, the state must protect people from things that might happen, and therefore we do need all these uh, safeguards that uh, we have built into, uh, into our law. Can we know for sure what changes in the environment will result from modifying the weather? Uh, scientists have been feeding data into the biggest computers available for almost 25 years, but they still can't reliably predict what will happen a week in advance because the physical problems are so complicated. So if we can't even be sure if it's going to rain next Tuesday, how can we be sure what will happen when we alter natural weather events? For example, farmers profit from heavy snowfalls because deep mountain snowpacks produce abundant runoff in the spring. But elk can starve if drifts cover their normal forage. Some wildflowers may fail to develop seeds if the snow melts unusually late. No one knows the effect this will have on small animals or, more importantly, on the total environment. Interactions between the machinery of civilization and the environment extend far beyond the weather. As man learns to control the most powerful natural forces, such as atomic energy, the risks, as well as the benefits, become greater. So scientists have the responsibility to predict and explain the future impact of their discoveries. And we all have the responsibility to pay attention so we can make intelligent decisions. In our complex and interconnected world, about the only thing we know for sure is that there will be no easy answers.